Good morning, everyone. Uh, wow, nice. So it's my first time here. I hope it's not my last. Uh, and Matt, thank you for the great effort to actually pronounce my unpronounceable Greek name. Um, yeah, um, I want to thank you guys for giving me the chance to actually talk about my favorite topic, which is cartilage. Um, actually, I've been uh, uh, dealing with cartilage lesions for the last, intensively for the last 10 years, uh, and especially with advanced uh, surgical procedures. Um, and it's a fascinating area to be involved in as a clinician and hopefully as a researcher at some point. So let's start. Uh, I'm supposed to running these. Are they running? Yes, great. So um, as you can see, the human body can do, uh, can withstand a lot of loads. And uh, it can do amazing things. And as you can see on the upper left corner for you, this is the world champion, the strong man, uh, Half Thor Bjornsson, the Icelandic mountain for the Game of Thrones fans. He lifted 650 kilos uh, for five steps on his own. Uh, and uh, that was a thousand-year-old thousand uh, Viking record. He broke it in 2015. Uh, we see also a very unsuccessful attempt, which we cannot actually see it complete on the bottom left corner. But again, even if it's successful or unsuccessful, some of our efforts are imposing a great l a load on our tissues. Now, most of the tissues have a big volume and mass, but cartilage is very small, thin, and it's a wonder how it works because we are talking about loads of more than 10 times body weight in some movements, and they are imposed on a tissue with just two to seven millimeters thickness. So it's good to do a small, a very brief uh, overview of the uh, natural wonder, as I call it, of articular cartilage through the anatomy and function. So cartilage is mainly chondrocytes, uh, a scarce no, um, number, like uh, there are not many, as in other tissues, uh, which are uh, responsible for producing all the extracellular matrix that they have to be surrounded by, which is comprised of water, 80% mostly, collagen, and especially type 2, most of it, proteoglycans, mostly aggregate. We'll talk a little bit about this later. Glycoproteins and some other uh, proteins and other uh, ingredients in very, very small proportions. So these are um, uh, photographs, actually, of a collagen fiber on the right and of a chondrocyte in its collagen fibers in its matrix on the left. So you can see that the chondrocyte is building a matrix around it. And this matrix is made from this amazing structure, the type 2 collagen, which is formed in a triple helix. Uh, its fibrils are actually uh, turning around, and they form a triple helix. And this creates an enormous ability for that collagen to withstand tensile forces and shear forces, um, which are really, really uh, big compared to its size. So um, cartilage tissue has the ability to withstand great tensile loads as well. But we also know that it can withstand a great amount of compressive force. How can it do that? Uh, basically, it's from the uh, protoglycans and mainly agrican on the red circle inside. You can see here. Agrican is an extremely hydrophilic molecule. So what it does, it attracts water. What we know about water, when we can find it somewhere in a confined space, it's incompressible. So we can have a very, very good uh, resistance to compression by just attracting water and not letting it go out. So the way the matrix is um, um, produced and inside the tissue, it does not permit the water to go out. It has a low permeability. So water can come in, but it cannot escape. Uh, just a word of caution, the cartilage, the cartilage doesn't like static loading. It likes brief, even high loading, but doesn't like static loading because then he starts losing water. And then he needs some time to um, 
come back to normal form. Now, this is a very popular drawing from the Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons back in 1994, and it shows beautifully on the left the structure of and the, um, the orientation and the location of the chondrocytes inside, and on the right side, you can see how the collagen fibers are uh, oriented. Now, you can see that on the superficial top, articular surface, uh, you see that the chondrocytes has a specific spindle shape uh, form, and as you can see, we have most of the collagen fibr fibers uh, arranged there. This is um, the most resilient part of the cartilage to shear forces, translational forces, and generally these kind of forces, and it acts like a lid for the cartilage, so it doesn't let the water and the rest of the ingredients go out, and it can resist, resist an enormous amount of tensile forces. Now, as we go deeper in here, we can see that the fiber starts to put, get in angles and become a little bit more perpendicular. So they have a mixed kind of ability to withstand tensile forces and compression forces. In the deeper portion down here, in the deep zone, we can see that the collagen fibers are perpendicular and they're uh, uh, the main, uh, they're actually supporting the rest of the matrix that can actually withstand all the compressive loads. Now the reason for this is that all these loads, whether tensile or compressive, have to go evenly to the calcified zone, which is the connection point between the cartilage and the bone. Now this way, uh, force is distributed nicely and evenly, and it's a really, really, from a mechanical point of view, an engineering point of view, it's a really, really nice and um, I would say impressive structure. Now this high specialization comes with a coast, with a coast or at a coast. Uh, we have limited healing ability for the cartilage. Why? Because it's highly specialized and it's, it hasn't an, doesn't have any vessels, doesn't have any uh, nerves, and it doesn't have a lymphatic drainage system. So it gets all its nutrition through osmosis and diffusion from the synovial fluid and from the subchondral bone. And because of that dense orientation of, of its matrix, the chondrocytes cannot migrate easily to go to the defect side when it's injured. Therefore, and in addition, we have a very harsh biomechanical environment with lots of shear forces, translation, uh, rotations, and compression. So it's not easy for that area unless it's unloaded to be um, to have uh, some form of a repair uh, effort. Now, I'm going to go briefly over the um, cartilage surgical repair options because Dr. Scott made it, stated beautifully in April, and also we had the previous Aspeter journal with the surgical options of cartilage to say everything you need to know about it. So I'm just going to point out the three major types of surgeries that we see. And the first one and the most widely used is microfracture. Microfracture is a one-stage arthroscopic procedure where the surgeon is actually cleaning the defect side down to the subchondral bone and penetrates the bone with special equipment in order to bring bone marrow stem cells up to the surface of the defect, which with proper loading and the proper mechanical environment will become a form of fibrocartilage. Now, this kind of um, procedure is now kept for small defects, as we know, because the fibrocartilage repair tissue is not of a, um, a good quality. And so for small lesions where contained, that means that the surrounding cartilage is good, we can have a good uh, outcome with this technique. Although the results are good for the first two years, after, until the five years and the, towards the 10 years, uh, we see a decline in function and, uh, and the outcome scores from patients, self-reported outcome measures. The second way uh, is the autologous or allograft osteochondral transplantation. We have the mosaic plasty, which is autologous cylinders plugged in the defect. They are coming from the same joint usually. And the, the, prongs of the pros of this uh, technique is um, that it's healing cartilage directly applied on the joint. It's bone to bone integration, most of it, so it's faster return to activity. There is, although some cons like 
donor side morbidity, we take some plugs out of the joint, usually from non-weight bearing surfaces, but again, we, we have a donor side morbidity. And the results so far are good up to 10 years with these techniques. Now, the L-graft osteochondrotransplantation is becoming very popular in, for large effects in, in the United States, mostly because they have allograft banks there uh, uh, readily available. Now, the third option, and I would say my favorite, is the autologous chondrocyte transplantation uh, techniques. There are so many techniques that we would probably need a whole Congress to actually talk about them. But the main idea is that we implant cells, autologous or allogenic, in the defect site, either on a matrix or covered by a periosteum membrane in the earlier years. Now, most of them are using membranes of various types, synthetic or biological. And it can be in a one-stage procedure. The latest uh, type of surgeries are one-stage arthroscopic. They just take some cells, some uh, healing cartilage from the joint. They um, take the chondrocytes from it, and they replant it in a new membrane. Now, this produces a healing-like cartilage with good results up to 20 years so far. However, it's a lengthy rehab process the lengthiest of all. So uh, ideally, for a rehabilitation plan, we need to have a pre-op education and planning uh, to, to be before the post-op rehab. And the pre-op education and training, we have certain things to do. First of all, if the joint is acute, we have to manage the signs and symptoms as we do with any kind of injury that we have at the knee. We have to explain to the patient the procedure because if it's an organized and planned surgery, we should know uh, ahead that what is going to happen to, to that uh, defect. Uh, it's very useful to take baseline measurements so that we know how the patient is pre-op and then we can compare it at the end. Uh, it's good to tr do some gait training with ba weight bearing restrictions so that the patient is aware of how to use the assistive devices. And then we have to set some individual goal setting, which I will uh, emphasize a little bit more in the next slide. And also discuss with the patient and give him ideas on how to plan his work and home issues because the surgery is gonna take a lot of his time and rehab is gonna take a lot of his time as well. So uh, any rehab um, lecture should have a, side a slide talking about the integration of biomedical and biopsychosocial psychosocial domains. So we treat the patient and not just the knee. Now, the um, motivational interviewing method is a great way to actually try to change the patient's attitude towards the problem. And instead of saying, I must do it, he has to say, he would probably say, I want to do it. Now, this is a little bit tricky, but the physio uh, especially because we have a, the ability to be with the patient way more time than the surgeons, is, uh, has to be able to manage the expectations of the patient with realistic goals. Um, <coughs> we should be pro promoting a no magic solution uh, behavior. So we have to change the mentality of patients that actually think that a pill or just a surgery will just fix their problem. They will go back to normal life without any problems. Uh, physio has to be, and generally the rehabilitation team has to be a buddy with uh, the patient. We have to make some connections with the patient if we want to succeed in our rehab program. And any kind of positive suggestions are always welcome when it comes to uh, dealing with a patient and his expect expectations. Now, the optimal goal setting is setting smart goals, so certain uh, setting specific measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bonded goals. Now, some examples would be of a specific goal would be able to demonstrate normal gait patterns using two crutches. This is something which comes really early after the post-op uh, sequence, so we need to make sure that the patient uh, has a goal ahead of him, which is very specific. I need to do this. Uh, measurable, we have we, and we should be able to uh, measure left-right differences, for instance, in some form of testing of his joint. Attainable, the patient is already ambulating in crutches, so we're not asking him for something extraordinary. Uh, realistic, and the realistic goal would be in the next few weeks to be able to weigh, bear, bear weight for 50% without symptom provocation. 
So we set a goal for the guy that is realistic. And time bonded meaning that we expect from him in a certain amount of time to demonstrate something, uh, one of its goals. And it would be show me your catwalk at some point. Now, the recovery of daily living, uh, we have to know that patients undergoing cartilage repair are usually young guys, active, and professional athletes, uh, sometimes here, <coughs> most of the times. So, it's an individual issue. Uh, the goals that have to be set are completely different for a sedentary person than for a professional football player. And we have to bear that in mind when we are designing a rehab protocol. Now, the factors to consider when we're designing the rehab protocol are divided as follows. That basically the patient factors are the age, the, as we know, as we grow older, cartilage doesn't heal as fast as it does when, it, when we're younger. The BMI, I would not be a very good candidate for cartilage repair. Okay, so uh, I, everybody should take a more conservative approach with me. Um, impact sports, obvious, place a higher demand on graft. And, but the good thing is that research shows that motivated persons and competitive athletes do much better uh, than unmotivated guys. And it's very, very important to take care of the psychological profile of the patient. If we have a patient with kinesiophobia or with fear of re-injury or um, uh, not very uh, high level of self-efficacy, we have to be careful because our outcomes at the end will not be very good. So we need to work on getting the patient out of that uh, hole of fear and uh, kinesiophobia. Now, other factors that have to do with the lesion when we're designing the program, we need to know the size. Small defects usually improve faster. We need to know the repair technique because we know that we're going to have a faster progression when we have osteochondral transplantation and it's going to be faster than the macrofracture, which is going to be faster than the autologous chondrocyte implantation, which is the one that has the longest rehab. The location is very important. I'm going to talk at the end about this. Guides the weight bearing and ROM restrictions. So we really need to know the exact location of the defect when we're designing the rehab protocol. Other factors are the symptom duration. Symptoms more than 12 months usually have a longer recovery and sometimes a poor prognosis. And we have to make sure that we are aware and we know about the concomitant procedures. If an ACL or a meniscal repair or an osteotomy for realignment are done, we have to adjust our rehab protocol to these uh, procedures as well. Now, um, there are many ways to divide a rehab protocol in phases, but the, the best one I think was done by Kai Mithofer and Karen Hambly back in 2012. Uh, and it integrated all the types of uh, cartilage repair techniques. So basically they divided in three phases, taking into account the basic science that they have at hand at that time and the clinical experience because we have, we cannot fool ourselves. It's more an art than a science when it comes to cartilage repair. The clinical studies are minimal, and, um, but the surgical studies are numerous. So we need to work a little bit more on uh, defining, uh, uh, proving our, our work in, the, in this case. Now, they divide it in three phases. Uh, the first phase is the most important one, which is the graft integration and stimulation. So it's the first days, few weeks after the graft is implanted. And um, at that point, the goal is to protect and activate the joint and try to restore joint homeostasis. Uh, the second phase is, it depends on the, on the technique, but we would say after six to 10 weeks after the operation until we go into the maturation phase, is the time where we start progressive loading and trying to do some functional do joint uh, restoration. The th third phase is a, um, the phase where we start to introduce the activity and we try to promote the cartilage tissue maturation and adaptation to the uh, specific demands of the patient, whether an athlete or a sedentary person. Now, this quote is that the selection of surgical technique and the individuality of each patient will influence the time scale for recovery. That's why you don't see and you will not see time scales on my presentation. 
I've seen micro fractures that were supposed to be back at six months to take more than a year. I've seen mosaic plasties that should be back at eight months, be ready to play at five months. Uh, so it's really hard to play with time. We have to respect at the early stages the biological process. But when is the player going to come back to sports or to work? is something that has to be based on criteria more than biology at the later stages. Now, and the phase one, the aims, is to restore the joint homeostasis by controlling pain and effusion, restoring impaired ROM, activate inhibited muscles, and release the hypertonic ones, regaining your muscular control. Basic stuff, I think everybody has an idea of it from ACL reconstruction and other knee surgeries. Now, sample interventions that we can use in this one, just sample interventions, are ice compression elevation, a decontinuous passive motion, a gait training with weight-bearing restrictions, mobility exercises to start gaining uh, other movements and patellar mobility, quad activation exercises and use of neuromuscular uh, electrical stimulation, start the aquatic therapy as soon as the stitches are off, and start no resistance cycling and rowing. Now, the first topic I want to uh, talk about is a debate that's still ongoing about to use or to not use the CPM machine. There is considerable debate, but in the early 80s and 90s, there were a lot of animal studies on CPM use that showed that the quality of cartilage from the use of CPM uh, is uh, higher, and uh, the, car the quality of the cartilage is also uh, much better than when CPM is not used. However, we only have two studies on humans, uh, one in favor and one that shows that it has no effect. The one that was in favor was done in 1994 by uh, Stedman's group, and it was retrospective, without control, a control group, and there were significant differences in the groups, uh, between groups, and they were confounding uh, factors. The age was not the same, the location of the defect was not the same, the size of the defect was not the same, so it, it reduced its clinical usefulness, I, w I would say. The other one was done a later, but it was still retrospective and poorly controlled. And the defects were small, were smaller than two centimeters, square centimeters, which we know that they will do well even without the CPM. Uh, but they, nothing was done on larger defects. And to go to the next one, um, there are a few factors not taken into consideration in the literature when we're talking about to use or to not use the CPM machine. Uh, the kinesiophobia and the fear avoidance beliefs of the patient. When we have a patient who is uh, afraid of moving his, his knee the first day after the operation, and we have a large, a big operation in our hands, it's, it's going to create a problem. So in cases where uh, the patient is afraid to move the knee, it would be a very good tool to use the CPM to actually give him control over his, the movement and also give him uh, goals because CPM can measure the range of motion and then we can set goals for the patient. While when they are doing it uh, with manual passive mobility, it's not so accurate and the patient is still very afraid and apprehensive and uses the muscles. So. It's not optimal, let's say, in these cases. Uh, a problem with CPM is the financial cost in other countries, not here. Uh, yeah, um, but it's, it's a serious issue. That's why many people did not um, go into um, researching on CPM and humans because it's not widely used in many countries because of the cost of actually renting the machine. And buying it, no way. Three, 4,000 euros for four weeks? Not really. Um, now, the good thing also about the CPM is that it minimizes the shear forces on the graft. It puts some force on the graft, but it, it's minimal because we don't have any muscular activation. No work has been done on that as well. Now, we have divided, uh, devised a small table that actually is some form of an algorithm on whether to use the CPM or not. So we ask some questions. Does the patient have access to a CPM machine? If no, then he has to do manual passive motion. Uh, if yes, he may proceed with the CPM use if the surgeon wants to. If, if the defect location is in the tibiofemoral joint, 
uh, and it's a small lesion, it's not necessary to use the CPM, except if the defect is large, more than two uh, square centimeters. Uh, if the, in the patellofemoral joint, it's a little bit different. It's indicated to control the shear forces. Uh, uh, the defect size I said about it, so it's indicated, especially in large defects and big surgeries, and um, especially it's indicated when the patient has kinesiophobia, as we said, and uh, anxiety of moving the knee. Now, the second topic is weight-bearing progressions. How much and when? During the early years of um, cartilage repair, the weight bearing progression was very slow, and it took up to 12 weeks to fully weight bear, three months. So later, especially after 2009, uh, a lot of people started um, researching on accelerated weight bearing uh, on uh, cartilage repair, especially in autologous contracite implantation, and found that it's safe and maintains the good outcomes even at five years post uh, op. There is a note, though, that uh, Jay Ebert, a good friend from Australia, did a really nice uh, work in 2008 about the, um, the tendency of the patients to overshoot when you teach them how to weight bear on a scale. So he found that they averagely uh, overshoot their uh, target by 10% almost. So we have to make sure that when we're teaching our patients to weight bear partially on their legs, that the chances are they're going to overshoot. So we have to be extra careful with that. Now, this is the progression in Jay Ebert's paper on how it was when they first introduced the first generation ACI, and it was up to 12 weeks. It started getting down to eight weeks with the second generation ACI, and now it's done down to the third and fourth generation ACI, which is more of a one-stage procedure, arthroscopic. They go to full weight bearing at six weeks and with really good results and self-reported outcome measures. Now, the third topic is the range of motion restrictions, and this is important with, uh, to, to have um, an honest uh, discussion with the surgeons. Uh, the fact one is that movement is necessary for joint homeostasis. I don't think anybody, anybody disagrees. The fact number two is that immobilization is detrimental for cartilage and all the rest of the soft tissues. The third fact is that for optimal joint homeostasis, we need proper muscle function. Otherwise, the joint will not reach homeostasis. So we really need to know the exact location of the defect. And mapping is absolutely essential for this. So we need to know from the surgeon the exact location and the size of the defect so that we can actually decide which part of the joint range of motion we can use in our rehab from the beginning, if we can. So, as you can see in these pictures, when we have uh, a patellofemoral joint problem here, we know, which is a higher trochlea defect or a lower patella defect, we know that it's going to engage pretty early. So we have to be careful with extension. While if we know that it's going to be down here or a higher patella defect, we know we can move a few uh, degrees in. If the surgeon has actually who has a better idea because he sees the joint in the operating theater, knows exactly the range of motion that we have a, um, a graft, let's say, um, pressure. We should know about it and uh, we should be aware of it so we can use it in our favor. So uh, going back to the phase one, instead of doing, using biology so much, we're using criteria. So we need a full passive range of motion to move to the phase two. We need a minimal or absent pain, which is arbitrarily set to 3 out of 10, but with no research behind it. Minimal or absent swelling, and we're still lacking um, a really objective way of measuring swelling. Um, we need to have restored muscle activation, at least of the quadriceps, but ideally for all the muscles that control the lower limb, and restore normal gait pattern with equal stride length and everything, and without limb. So the phase two, which is the matrix production where the cells start producing matrix and they start organizing the collagen fibers, we need to increase the loading gradually and control and restore the strength and the neuromuscular control of the joint. 
So sample interventions, resistant training with low loads in safe ranges, concentric, too eccentric. We have to go from ballast progressions to uniplanar to multiplanar and stable and unstable surfaces. And we need to introduce low, low, low load plyometrics at some point later in that phase. Now, um, it would take me probably a day to start speaking about my favorite tool these days, which is blood flow restriction training. These uh, patients are the ideal uh, subjects, the ideal patients for using blood flow restriction training. Uh, I hope this will be um, a topic for the next um, lecture, hopefully, pretty soon. Um, it's very promising. Uh, blood flow restriction training, just briefly for a second, will, is uh, restricting the blood flow partially on the limb and introducing a low, low load, less than 30% of repetition maximum to the muscles. The muscles have a metabolic stress and they feel that they're lifting a high load while the joint feels that it lifts a low load. So with these compromised patients, we can actually uh, load the muscle and gain hypertrophy and strength without loading uh, the, uh, the area of the graft, for instance. Um, criteria to go to phase three, which is the activity return, is full and pain-free range of motion minimal or absent pain, minimal absent swelling, and some um, basically criteria stolen from ACL, I would say, which is arbitrarily set to 20% <coughs> uh, for isokinetic um, deficit, 10% in functional hopping tests, self-reported outcome measures uh, above 90. Personally, I think it's very, very high. Um, to ask for a 19 course or IKDC before you enter the final phase, um, and an MRI evaluation of the graft by the surgeon. Now, the aims of the third phase, easy, restoring the symmetry, strength, and power of the lower limb and the whole athlete, and return to functional sport-specific training. Now, uh, the future directions in cartilage repair. Two topics I want to touch in this one. Uh, the uh, concept of intermittent compression on graft. There is uh, currently no research done on that, although in the post-op protocols, the, uh, many people talk about stimulating the graft uh, very early with mechanical compression. Now, the contracide, in order to produce the extracellular matrix, needs to have two stimuli. One is the mechanical stimulus that we are responsible to provide as physios, and uh, the biochemical stimulus which is very important as well. Uh, the biochemical stimulus when we, they implant the cells inside the joint uh, is a little bit vague because it has a soup of pro-inflammatory agents and a soup of anti-inflammatory agents fighting each other. Now, on the other hand, uh, the um, mechanical stimulus is significantly reduced inside the joint because we have to protect it. Therefore, it's a little bit uh, obscure that a chondrocyte's journey from the bioreactor where it gets immediately from day one pressures of 10 megapascals, which is more than 100 kilos force per square centimeter, into going into a defect size where it actually is minimally stimulated. Because why? Because we want to protect the graft and we don't load the graft until several weeks later. So we have a contracite which gets an enormous amount of stimulation, mechanical stimulation in vitro, but when it comes in vivo, the stimulation goes down. What is going to happen in that uh, uh, contracite and its matrix synthesis? It's definitely gonna change. So therefore, uh, there was, um, last year it was introduced to us by Barbara Wondrush uh, and it's unpublished yet, from what I know, uh, the stimulation of chondrocytes for the non-surgical treatment of cartilage lesions. So compression uh, on the um, area of the defect in multiple angles as a warm-up before high-impact loads and when patient has pain during loading activities, increase the gag contact, the glucosaminoglycan contact, content in the defect area on MRI. So they did an MRI before, they did the compression, they did an MRI after, there was increased gag content in that defect. Now this is a great way to, um, to move on 
also post-op because a controlled compression on the graft area without movement with a gradual increase in pressure while monitoring swelling and pain and the use of technology like force sensors, plates, and other systems that are out there for quantification of our intervention, how much pressure we're putting on that graft. And also the idea that the patient can do that at home, regularly during the day, is uh, a great way to actually stimulate and give that contracite what it wants, which is continuous stimulation after it leaves the bioreactor and it's implanted in the graft. We can talk, there, is, there are no um, guidelines on when to start and how to start. My personal clinical experience in that is that I've been um, using it from if it's possible, if I have the patient and me by day two, uh, starting compression immediately. Because what we need to do is the stimulation, the mechanical stimulation of the uh, chondrocyte will also make the chondrocyte produce anti-inflammatory agents. So the soup that's around there and the biochemical stimulus will improve if we improve the mechanical stimulus. Now, um, another one that came to me uh, last year, and I have to thank Rod for this because he introduced me to Tim Gabbett's work on uh, load monitoring. And I thought we should do the same for cartilage patients. Instead of saying injury risk, we should say joint flare up or flare down. So we need to find the sweet spot of loading for these patients at the later stages. But even in the early stages, cheap solutions like pedometers and activity monitors can actually tell us a lot about the load that the patient is uh, putting on that cartilage. Um, and in the advanced phases, the advanced load monitoring systems can tell us a lot about the athlete's load on that joint and generally in the body. But we can actually set some criteria on gradually improve um, loading the joint and controlling the load without serious spikes in the activity. This would probably save us a lot of frustration and a lot of time in the later stages where we <laughs> actually give the exercise and we give a dosage of exercise without really knowing how much we actually load the patient. That wraps it up. Thank you very much. <laughs>